The following newspaper excerpt caught our eye during research. The news of this accident was published in all foreign papers, and one of them gave us the particulars of it in a letter said to be written by Monsieur de la Fon. Several letters, however, have been received by the last India ship, advising that the company's ship, the Prince, Captain Morin, arrived at Pondicherry on the 23rd of October. The Public Advertiser, August 9th, 1753. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the story, The Fatal Flames of the Prince? Here we are. Enjoy! The French East India Company ship, the Prince, had not started her voyage from the port of Lorient in a promising way. As they had weighed anchor on the 19th of February, 1752, the wind had been in their favor, but as they passed the island of St. Michael, the wind had suddenly shifted, and the ship found itself in trouble. They were no longer able to stay on their course, and in spite of their efforts, the ship grounded on a sandbank. To the alarm of the people on board the ship, had also grounded in such a way that the mouths of their cannons were now in the water. Immediately, distress signals were flown, and Monsieur de Godieu, the commander of the port of Lorient, boarded their ship to assist. Lieutenant de la Fond, who is our primary source of information for this story, credited Monsieur de Godieu completely with saving the ship from the sandbank. The port commander took charge of the situation, and immediately ordered that all the valuable cargo which included presents from the French East India Company for the Nabob of Golconda to be transferred to smaller vessels for safekeeping. He then ordered that all of the chests of goods also be transferred to lighten the ship. Through the night, the crew worked, and with the high tide of the next morning, the prince was once again off of the bank and able to sail for Port Louis. Though the ship was no longer grounded, her misadventure on the bank had caused damage. The prince now had several leaks that luckily the ship's pumps were able to handle, and they unloaded half of the ship's cargo in Port Louis before turning back to the port of Lorient to unload everything else and repair the ship. She was no longer in good enough condition to make the long voyage they had ahead of them. The prince was careened and caulked to close up her seams, which the sandbank had damaged. She was then, once again, loaded with cargo and prepared to attempt the voyage again. Lieutenant Delafond found the incident on the sandbank to be reassuring rather than something to be concerned about. The prince was a sturdy enough ship that all she needed was some caulking after running aground. That was enough to make him think but the ship was almost indestructible. On the 10th of June, 1752, the prince once more set sail. And this time, the trip seemed to be more promising. They were met with favorable winds and smooth sailing for the first leg of their journey. It wasn't until the 26th of July that disaster struck the ship once again. Lieutenant de la Fond was the officer of the watch, and had just finished taking observations to ensure they were still on course, when someone came to him to report that there was smoke coming from one of the hatchways. Lieutenant de la Fond did not have the keys to the hold. Those were held by the ship's first lieutenant who was soon brought to the deck and opened all of the hatchways in the hopes of finding the source of the smoke. But this also served to give more air to the fire, and soon the smoke was getting thicker. Lieutenant de la Fond had already ordered sails to be thrown overboard so that they could soak up seawater, 
and now he had them fished up and did what he could to deprive the fire of air by having the hatches closed again and then covering them with wet sails. This did not prove to be enough to stop the billowing smoke, though, and Lieutenant Delafon then suggested that they flood the ship with about a foot of water in the hopes that this would be enough to put out the fire. Unfortunately, it was found that the fire had already grown far past such an action to be useful. On board the ship was a company of soldiers led by Monsieur de la Touche, and Captain Morin now requested the soldiers bring out their weapons and stand ready to restrain the crew if panic began to set in. De la Touche was described as being particularly level-headed during the emergency, with good control over his soldiers, but he was an experienced commander, having been in command of the French troops who had defeated Nazar Singh the previous Nabob of Golconda. Under the watchful eyes of the soldiers, the entire crew was put to work throwing water on the growing fire. Buckets were filled with seawater, water was pumped into the hold by the ship's pumps, and even the drinking water was thrown on the flames, but nothing seemed able to slow the spread. In the midst of all this, Captain Modin had decided that the ship's yawl was in the way and he ordered that it be lowered overboard. Taking advantage of this, while the rest of the crew was still trying to fight the fire, three sailors and the ship's bosun took possession of the yawl. The yawl had not been launched with the intention of using it so the people who boarded it found that there were no oars on board, and shouted up for some. Three more sailors jumped overboard carrying oars and joined the crew of the yawl, only for them to find that they also did not have a rudder. Initially, this caused the men on the yawl to shout up to the ship, asking for a rope to be thrown to them, since they could not steer the yawl. But on realizing how much of the ship was now burning, they decided, instead, to row as far away from the ship as they could. Lieutenant de la Fond would later credit most of the men on board the ship with having remained courageous, though he does not reproach the men who took control of the yawl either. The ship's master decided to try to venture into the hold to try to find the source of the fire and assess the situation after throwing a large amount of water over himself, but he was soon driven back onto the deck by the heat. It was decided that the ship was past saving at this point, and attention was turned to the ship's boats, but most of the people on board were already so exhausted from the prolonged fight against the fire that launching the boats proved past their abilities. The jolly boat was almost launched, but the fire had at this point spread up the main mast, to which the tackle to hoist the boat had been attached. The ropes were quickly burnt through, and the jolly boat pitched onto the guns of the ship before falling bottom up, and everyone gave up on the idea of the boat. Instead, the men on board began to throw everything they could get their hands on overboard so that they could use them as flotation devices, while the ship's chaplain stood on the quarterdeck and gave general absolution to all present. Lieutenant Delafon ordered the ship's helm be turned hard to starboard, which gave shelter to that side of the ship and allowed the people on board the ship somewhere to stand on the deck for a little while longer though the larboard side of the ship was now an inferno. All around him, Lieutenant de la Fond watched as people jumped into the sea, either to catch hold of a piece of wreckage, or to sink below with the fatalistic view that it was a better end than the fire would offer. He could also hear the screams of the people who were caught in the flames. To make things worse, the fire had reached the guns of the ship, which were all loaded, and now were firing ending even more lives and adding a new danger and level of confusion to the already chaotic situation. With things having reached this point for the first time, Lieutenant Delafon says that he turned his thoughts from saving the ship to how he could save himself. Finding that he was now alone on the deck, he went to the roundhouse where he found De La Touche and Captain Morin. De La Touche remained calm still. He simply hugged Lieutenant de la Fond and told him goodbye, but Captain Morin was in a state of shock, guilt, and grief. For Captain Morin, 
a lot of his guilt was because he had convinced two of his cousins, both young women, to join him on the voyage as passengers after promising them a safe and enjoyable trip. Instead of fulfilling his promise, Captain Morin had been forced to instruct his cousins to remove their bulky clothing and trust themselves to wooden hen coops that were thrown into the sea, supported on each side by sailors who had volunteered for the task. No one on board thought it was likely that another ship would come any time soon, and Captain Morin considered the chicken coops to only be prolonging the inevitable, and considered himself to be responsible for the loss of his cousins. It was very clear that Captain Morin had no intention of leaving his ship until the end, and De La Touche stated that his intention to remain and offer what comfort he could to his friend. Lieutenant de la Fond, therefore, left the roundhouse and entered the starboard gallery, only to turn and see the flames engulf the roundhouse entirely and rush in his direction. Lieutenant de la Fond did not think his chances in the ocean were very high, and thought of it as only prolonging the inevitable for a couple of hours. But he still took off his clothing, and half climbed, half fell, down one of the ship's yards into the sea. The water was full of death, and people struggling. And Lieutenant Morin found himself a progressive series of larger pieces of wood to cling to, with the intention of preserving his strength for as long as possible, even though he was a capable swimmer. He began with a flagstaff, then a yard, followed by another larger yard with several people on it. And finally, he joined a large number of people who had taken shelter on the mainmast after it had burned away and fallen overboard. In total, Lieutenant de la Fond estimated that as many as 80 people were clinging to the mainmast. But they faced constant danger from the cannonballs being fired by their own sinking ship and exhaustion also took hold. For the next three hours, Lieutenant de la Fond clung to the mast as people slowly dropped off of it. Around five in the afternoon, Lieutenant de la Fond saw the yawl come into sight, and he shouted to them that he was their lieutenant and asked them to help him on board. The men on the yawl agreed, on the condition that Lieutenant de la Fond swam to them, since they were worried that if they came near the still-crowded mainmast, the boat would be swarmed by desperate people and sink. They admitted that the main reason that they would allow Lieutenant de la Fond on board was because he knew how to navigate, so he was their main hope for finding land. Agreeing that it was too dangerous for the yawl to come close to the mainmast, Lieutenant de la Fond swam to the yawl and was pulled on board. Following closely after him was the pilot and ship's master, who de la Fond convinced the sailors to also allow on board the yawl. Once the three of them were on board it, it was decided that they were still too close to the burning ship to be safe, and they rowed further away. A little while later, the fire reached the ship's powder room, and the prince blew up. The black smoke cloud was large enough to make everything around them dark for a short time, and burning debris still rained down around them, even though they had thought they had gone far enough away to be safe. Though they were surrounded by the horrors of the explosion and fire now, they were not able to leave yet. Since the yawl had not been launched with the thought of it carrying anyone, it had no provisions on board, and they were forced to row through the disaster area in the hope of finding anything to eat or drink for their voyage. The barrels that they initially found were discovered to carry gunpowder, which had been thrown overboard when the ship had caught fire, but around nightfall, they were lucky enough to find a cask of brandy, 15 pounds of salt pork, some cloth, and some planks. Worried that the rubble of the ship would destroy them in the night, they still were not allowed to rest, but instead rowed out of the wreckage and got to work. One of the sailors had two needles with him, 
and they were able to turn one of the oars into a mast with the cloth as a sail, and turn one of the planks into a badly needed rudder, allowing the wind to take them where it would, since they had no charts to plot a course. They abandoned the remains of the prince entirely. Ten survivors, out of what had been a ship carrying almost three hundred. The people on the boat were all naked, and they suffered during the day from excessive sun, and then at night from the cold, but the only cloth they had, they had used for a sail. They were able to set a course based on the position of the stars and the sun every day, and knew they were a little over 500 miles from the coast of Brazil, but they were going to have to make it there. They were able to get some fresh water from rainfall on their fifth day in the open boat, and were so greedy for it that they even sucked the moisture from the sail. But other than that one short rainfall, they only had a little brandy to drink each day, which did nothing to soothe their thirst. Their only food was a small piece of salt pork once a day, and by the eighth day, the mood on the boat was full of despair, as everyone grew more and more weak. Lieutenant de la Fon spent the eighth night of their voyage at the helm, but after ten hours he collapsed next to his companion who had already given up. It was, therefore, with some amazement as dawn broke that they realized they could see land. At 2 p.m. on the 3rd of August, 1752, the ten men set foot on the soil of Brazil and immediately threw themselves on the sand out of relief. They knew that they were somewhere in Brazil, but they did not know if they had found an area that was inhabited, and they were just trying to determine what course they should take when a group of about 50 armed approached them and demanded to know why they had landed on their shore. Interested in preserving his dignity since he was the representative of the group of castaways, Lieutenant de la Fond tied a piece of cloth that had served as the sail around his waist and then went to explain to the men what had occurred. It was a story that was bound to be met with sympathy, and soon the castaways were being led to a place where they could rest and have food. First they came to a river, which all ten of the men threw themselves into, both drinking their fill of fresh water for the first time in over a week, and also bathing off all of the salt and dirt that had built up by their adventure. Once they left the river, they were brought to a house where they were fed and given clothes, though their host did not have any shoes to give them. The sailors were told that their best hope would be to travel to the more populous Paraíba, which was about 50 miles away, and they were given an escort of three soldiers to take them. Worried that they would not always be able to find food on the way, they traded the remainder of their brandy for an ox, which they slaughtered and smoked the meat of to ensure they would have provisions. Having prepared, they set out barefoot as they were. They did not have far to walk as they expected, though. After one day's trek, they met soldiers from the commander of the local fort who had been told of their plight and had sent men to meet with them. The commander fed them, gave them a place to rest, and then gave them a boat to make the rest of the trip. The governor in Paraíba also offered them hospitality, but since they had heard that there was going to be a Portuguese fleet leaving soon for Europe, the castaways insisted on leaving after three days and headed to Pernambuco. Since he had been walking this whole time barefoot, at this point Lieutenant de la Fon's feet were so torn up he could hardly stand on them. He was even given a horse to make the trip, and after four days, they arrived in Pernambuco. Here again, they were met with kindness from everyone they met, including the admiral of the fleet, and it was agreed to give all ten men passage to Lisbon. Once in Lisbon, the French consul was able to find them a passage to Morlaix, and on the 2nd of February, 1753, Lieutenant de la Fond was able to set foot once more on French soil. His health destroyed, and with no possessions to his name, having lost everything with the sinking of the prince.
While waiting for the fleet to depart from Brazil, Lieutenant de Lavande had sent word ahead to the company about what had happened to their ship, and the tragic news quickly spread to the newspapers of Europe. Only to then be met with conflicting reports from letters sent from India, which reported sightings of some of the passengers who had been on board the Prince, and assurances that the Prince had arrived safely. Though these letters were probably innocent matters of mistaken identity, they added to a great deal of confusion as families did not know if people had been lost forever or had arrived safely in India. It was not until Lieutenant de Lafon was able to reach Lorient that the entire story was told, and no one was left with any doubt of the tragedy that had taken place. For more information, please see The Mariner Chronicle, published by George W. Gorton in 1835, or see other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.